love your Father and friend in heaven. Loving Lord, we come again just to tabernacle at thy full stool this day. And we come in the name of Jesus. And Lord, we're being spoiled by your blessings, Lord. When this campaign comes to a close and we be in our homes during the weekdays, we be spoiled being fed from the bread of heaven. I pray, loving Lord, that these couple of weeks of evangelistic explosion will change each and every one of us. And we come to thee this night in the precious and blessed name of Jesus. Amen. Lord, it's such an important message I'm going to speak about tonight. You've infused my heart yes. to deliver such a message. And I pray that everyone will receive it with a type of way a Christian is supposed to receive the truth. In humility. Yes. And whether it troubles us or it makes us feel sad or glad, doesn't make a difference. It's the truth in Jesus. Amen. So Lord, please cover us with thy holy wings. And if the powers of darkness are lurking anywhere, I pray you rebuke them in the name of Jesus. And not only that, you bind them, loving Lord. Amen. So your truth will go forward uninterrupted. Yes. You've been good to us. Amen. And we want to thank you for your loving kindness and your loveliness. And we just want to tell you that we love you this night. Yes. And we leave everything in your holy hands. Yes. Because this is our prayer and our praise with divine thanks. In Jesus' name, let everybody say. Amen. Oh, good night, everybody. Good night. Did you have a good day today? Yes. Brother, give me some more on this. I think it's now. Yes, brother, give me some more on this. I think it's now. All right. Okay, okay, okay. We're getting there. Okay, I'm going to stick to what I said yesterday because there's a few people who are waiting for a few um, questions to be answered and I did say that I would answer them today. Now, Pastor got me up here early and I'm thankful for that and, um, and um, I'm going to try and capitalize on that time by getting us out here nearer to nine o'clock than nearer to half nine so we can come back here tomorrow, all right? Amen. Not for us to go home and watch television. <laughs> and you know, every night I'm saying like, you know, I want to, um, I want someone to give some testimonies on television, but time is so packed together that we don't have much time to really talk to one another. So what I might do, I think, I think Sabbath evening, I think Sabbath evening after Divine Hour, we might have a chance to talk about the experiences and the blessings we've been having. Tomorrow night's message is important. You can't miss tomorrow night. You should have missed tonight. <laughs> Take your pastors. Words. You should have missed tonight. Did you have a good night last night? Yes. Well, you know, we should have missed last night than tonight. But you're here tonight. But you need to be here tomorrow night. You should have missed tonight. Tomorrow night is very important. And that's Tuesday night. Then when are we going to be back here? Wednesday night. It's special what night? Youth night. And also prayer night. I mean, I'll tell you something. I was doing some of the youth message today. And I'm telling you, even though it was daylight, Sister, you took the words out of my mouth. What Satan is planning and doing to brainwash the young people to not be able to worship God properly. I'm glad it was daylight I was doing it because the research I was doing, I might be giving you this amount of research, but the research I have to do is ginormous. And what I have to go and read and what I have to go and study just so I can give you a segment. I'm glad it was the daytime. So, Wednesday is going to be so. What are we going to be doing Wednesday? We're going to be having live food, no dead food. And it's going to be raw. All day. Did you enjoy last Wednesday? Yes. Well, we're going to have it again this Wednesday. 
and it's special prayer time as well. So when are we going to start praying? Six o'clock in the morning, and one again, Nine. and then one again, Twelve. and then one again, Three. and then one again, Six. and then we're going to be back here and we're going to be charged up Nine. because the message that the Lord has for us is going to move each and every one of our hearts to want to get close to the living God. Nine. And then we'll be back here Thursday. No. no, we're going to be in our homes. And what are we going to be doing? Watching television? No. no, we're going to be having family worship. We're going to be meeting our friends. Some of us are going to be coming here and meeting pastors because we're going to get ready to chop the water. Amen. Amen. Come on and say amen. amen. And then Friday evening, which is the sixth day of the week. Well, no, we're going to be here on the No, we're going to be at the, at the end of the sixth day. We have a message which the Lord has laid on my heart to speak to you lot about. And I pray that when we come here Friday night, we come here determined and prepared to be filled to the capacity which we can cope with because the Holy Ghost is going to move in this place Friday night. Amen. Then we're going to be back here Sabbath morning. And I've got a message for you. And it's about the 144 and the close of probation. And then Sabbath evening, I'm going to take you to heaven by grace. Amen. And then the curtains are coming down, and I'm going to say I love you, and I'm going to always remember you, because many of you have blessed my heart. Amen. All right, some questions. What is the difference between the sealing of the Holy Spirit in Ephesians 1, 13 and 14, and the seal of God in Revelation chapter 7 in regards to the Sabbath? Okay, so let's first take a look at Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. Turn the Bibles with me. Well, to make sure I answer these questions. Ephesians chapter 1, 13 and 14. I did ask my pastor if I was, was able to answer these questions. He said, yeah, fair enough, no problem, go ahead, preacher. So I'm going to answer these questions. Ephesians chapter 1, but reading verse 13 and 14. In whom are you there? If you are there, let me hear you say amen. amen. In whom you also trusted after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. In whom also after that you believe you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of what? It was a promise. Which is the earnest of our inheritance until, until what? The redemption of the purchased possession. What was the purchased possession? What? Amen, sister. Guess who brought us back to God? Jesus. And he purchased what? Our house? Our car? What did he purchase back? Our bodies. We belong back to God. And the Holy Ghost here is the Holy Ghost seal that you are a child of the living God. And that my God is going to seal you for eternity. Because some people may not be able to withstand living in the sight of a holy God without an intercessor. He's going to put them to sleep. But that don't mean they're not going to get to heaven. And let me tell you something, my brothers and sisters, when you go down with Jesus in that grave, an angel marks that spot. And when the clarion call comes and Jesus comes back and calls the dead saints from the grave, that angel is going to take you out of that grave and the resurrection is going to happen. And my brothers and my sisters, you have been sealed by the Holy Ghost, therefore that you are getting ready for translation. No translation that says we don't die, but you're getting ready to get up into your chariots and live forever. So this Holy Spirit seal is the seal that you are a child of the living God and Satan does not have no claim over your life because you've been brought back by the blood of Jesus. Amen. 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 All right, now there's another seal. But in Revelation chapter 7, this is a different seal. Now, um... And verse 2, Revelation 7, reading verse 2. And I saw another angel ascending from the east. Anything from the east is from the, from, from the throne of the living God. 
having the seal of the living God, he cried with a loud voice of the four angels who was given to her of the earth and the sea, saying, Her not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God. This ain't no seal that God has purchased your body and you are God's for eternity. This is a seal in your forehead. For what, sir? Because God has to get the people, which you're going to hear Sabbath morning, He has to get the people who get the victory over sin. I hear some people say that we, we're going to be corrupted till Jesus comes, but I don't know how that one's going to work. When I mean corrupt, I mean we're going to be sinning until the time when Jesus comes. Because one year before Jesus comes, he closes probation. So whoever is translated alive without seeing death, you have to be spiritually strong enough to last one year without sinning. And you might ask me, how do you know it's one year? I tell you Sabbath morning. But God is going to get a people and they are called, they are known by a number. The 144,000. Don't ask me what this literal symbol is, I don't know. But all I know is known by a number. And these people, they finish the work. The finishing of the work isn't really every nation, every kingdom, every tongue here in the everlasting gospel. Because God knows how to do that. There's enough technology in the world to get the gospel around the world in one week. The real work of finishing is how is God going to get sin out of you and I life? And that's what we're going to talk about Sabbath morning. Because you have to get to the point where you can see sin right in front of your eyes and you prefer to fear God Amen. than to fall into sin. Amen. Amen. How can you do such a wicked thing and sin against God? Amen. You have to get the victory on your temper. You have to get the victory over your passions. Amen. You have to get the victory over your diet. Amen. You have to get the victory over just worshiping dead. You have to get the victory over how you actually relate with God. Because let me tell you something. Those people, the 144,000, they are going to be walking in the atmosphere of heaven on earth. Amen. And it's how bad you want it. It's how much you want it. God is not going to force it on you. All those who hunger and thirst for it, he will give you the power Amen. to get that type of victory and have that type of walk. Amen. But some people don't really want it. They just want to be Christians and be called Christians. I want more than that. I want to look, talk, walk, and live and have the faith of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All right. So that's a different type of seal. This is a seal to get to actually, it actually seals you to the point where you're so tight with the Lord. That you can't sin. I know that might sound funny, but you can't sin. It's just so out of harmony with you. And I, I, I relate it to smoking. I hate passive smoking. I hate walking behind people who are smoking, blowing the smoke out, and then the carbon dioxide with the nicotine travels and hits my face. Yes. I hate it. Yes. That's how much you got to get to the point where you hate sin. Amen. Amen. The devil can't tempt me through smoking, and he's got. I got to get to the point that every single sin yes. is the same way. He can't tempt me no more. That's right. Amen. Because the Holy Ghost lives in me one hundred percent. Amen. 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 Praise God. Amen. Do you want that seal? Yes. Yeah. Amen. I tell you something. If you want that seal, it doesn't come overnight. That's right. That's right. You're going to have to make some sacrifices for what many of us are not willing to make. Yes. Yes. It's going to cause a lot of persecution in your life. Yes, sir. Your husband or your wife might even be against you. Yes, your church brethren might even be against yes, you. Yes, but that don't mean you're wrong. That's right. Truth does not always go with the majority. That's right. So, that's the seal. There was another one. There was, um, hold on. Is that clear? Yes. yes. Okay. 
Can you, can you explain and give a text to prove Jesus lost one third of his divinity? Well, I can't give you a text what actually says it openly plain, but I can give you a text which technically says it, but it doesn't say it on the surface, but it says it when you read into it. In Philippians chapter 2, Philippians chapter 2, look there with me, Philippians chapter 2, reading verse 5 and 8. And if anybody has any better text, then feel, please feel free to um, let me know or let us know. Um, Philippians chapter 2, reading verse 5 to 8. And the Bible says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God he thought it wasn't robbery what was going to happen to him because he was equal with God and he was a, 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 you see, he had a mind that even though he was equal with God he didn't think he was being robbed yes sir but made himself of no reputation <laughs> and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man he humbled himself and became obedient unto death even the death of the cross what was the robbery which Jesus could have felt uncomfortable about. It was the robbery that he was equal with God and something was going to be taken from him because he, wanted, he had to become man. And he said, no, I'm not being robbed. John 3.16 said, God so loved the world he so loved, don't forget that word, he never just loved the world, he so loved the world, yes, sir. that he gave, mm. and when my God gave, he never gave to take it back, mm. Jesus has been given to humanity for eternity, yes. and when we get to heaven, did you know that we're going to see the nail scars in his hands? Yes. Because when many, many people who live before the cross, when they get to heaven and they realize that that's the Messiah who died for their sins, they're going to say, what are these nail scars in my hands? Jesus is going to say, I was wounded in the house of my friends. What? What do you mean in the house of your friends? The church I belong to, they killed me. Everywhere we go, we're going to see his nail scars in his feet, in his hands. Forever. You know who's with Jesus forever as well? Not the great multitude, you know. 144,000. Wherever Jesus goes in the universe, the 144,000 are like trophies going everywhere with him. Because you know what? They are the ones who completed the atonement in heaven and made Jesus close probation. Because Jesus can't close probation until 144,000 are produced. Because Satan said, You can't even get one. God said, I'm going to get more than one. I'm going to get 144,000. So, this robbery was technically when Jesus became man, he had to relinquish a part of his divinity. And that was him being able to be omnipresent, being anywhere and everywhere at the same time. That's why Jesus says, need for that I go away. Because if I don't go away, the Holy Ghost won't come. But I need to go away. So when the Holy Ghost comes, when we're in England, the Holy Ghost can be in here. If people need them in Israel, the Holy Ghost can be there. I can't. I'm cumbered with flesh. I have to take plane to go places. The Holy Ghost don't need no plane. The Holy Ghost can be anywhere and everywhere at the same time. Amen. Is that alright, everybody? Amen. The Spirit of Prophecy gives some quotes as well, but we don't need to talk about that because we know Spirit of Prophecy does explain it. Alright, here's another one now. Now, this is the one which is causal. I know, time is rushing, but forgive me, Pastor. I love you enough to deal with this one. A lot of people have placed a lot of emphasis on. All right, half a 
now I'm going to speed on speed through this. A lot of people have placed emphasis on, you know, what is wrong and what is right for us to do on the Sabbath. Hmm. And I'm going to deal with it right now. We understand about the laws of, 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 of the marriage vow. Um, Genesis uh, 128. Genesis chapter 128. Genesis chapter 128. Genesis chapter 128. And I suggest that you write these things down. Genesis chapter 128. And whenever I don't finish tonight, I will complete it tomorrow, okay, in the message. Genesis chapter 1, read it verse 28, but I think this is important because this has to do with people's sanctification. Genesis 1, 28, or 27 and 28. Um, so God created man in his own image, and the image of God created him. Male and female created them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. What did God do just here? God married Adam and Eve. Yes. And God blessed them. And God said they can be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Yes. And marriage is a divine institution given to us by the living God. Yes. It is a blessed institution as well. And Satan wants to try and corrupt the body card. Well, he has tried to, but there are people who love God who will keep it pure. Amen. Amen. Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 13, reading verse 4. Hebrews chapter 13, reading verse 4. Hebrews 13, reading verse 4. I'm going to try and go as quick as I can, Pastor. Hebrews 13, reading verse 4. But the saints, I believe, they need to hear this. Hebrews chapter 13, reading verse 4. And the visitors. Hebrews 13, reading verse 4. Are you there? If you are there, to hear say amen. amen. Hebrews 13, reading verse 4. And the Bible says, Marriage is what, church? It is honorable. That means it is exalted in all areas. Marriage is exalted. In the bedroom, it's exalted. When you talk to one another, it's exalted. You don't talk to one another like each other's an animal. And it's a disgrace for a man to put his hand upon a woman and beat up a woman. Marriage is honorable. Amen. Exalted. In all. And the bed is undefiled. But whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge you. Yes. So we know that marriage is a blessed institution. You can come together as husband and wife, and there is nothing in there which makes you sinful or unclean. That's right. Because the bed is undefiled. Amen. Amen. All right. Amen. But 1 Samuel 21, 3 and 6 says something. Turn there with me. 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel 21. And I know I'm going to show you some texts that many of you haven't seen. But don't worry. Go home. Pray. Don't get upset with me. Just pray. <laughs> 1 Samuel 21. Three to six. Now the problem was David was running from Saul. Saul wanted to kill David because Saul realized that David was anointed by the living God and that David was going to take the throne while Saul was occupying. And Saul wanted to kill David so Saul could stay on the throne of, 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 of Israel. But listen, what happened is that David ran to the sanctuary and wanted to go to the high priest and he wanted some bread. Listen, verse 3, now therefore, what is under thine hand? Verse 3, now therefore, what is under thine hand? Give me five loaves of bread in mine hand, or what there is present. And the priest answered David and said, There is no common bread under my hand, but there is hallowed bread, if the young men have kept themselves at least from women. And David answered the priest and said unto him, Of a truth, women have been kept from us about these three days since I came out, and the vessels of the young men are what? Oh! So if they was with their wives, then their vessels would not have been holy. They would not have been able to have the bread, the hallowed bread. But since they had a bead with no women, then they was able to have the bread. Amen. Because their vessels was holy. Amen. Exodus chapter 19. Exodus chapter 19, reading verse 15. Exodus chapter 19, reading verse 15. Exodus chapter 19. Reading verse 15, God came down and he wanted to give the children of Israel the Ten Commandments. And listen to what God says in Exodus chapter 19, reading verse 15. And the Bible says, Are you there? If you are there, let me hear you say amen. amen. 
Exodus chapter 19, read the verse 15, and the Bible says, And he said unto the people, Be ready against the third day, and come not at your wives. In other words, God was telling the men, Listen, I ain't coming down to give you the Ten Commandments. And when I give you the Ten Commandments, I'm coming down a monster. But if I come down a monster, you have to be holy. So you know what? Don't come at your wives. Keep yourself quiet. Because I'm a holy God. Amen. And there's a type of holiness that we don't really know about. There's a holiness to the letter. And then there's a holiness to the spirit. Yes. But then there's another holiness where we don't even know as God's people. That's a type of environment that we have not even entered into. It's a type of holiness that is so holy only God can reign in there. Amen. Mm. Yes, sir. And it's a type of holiness that we don't even understand as human beings. Listen. So, okay. Why can't we go before God when we come to our wives or our wives come to us? Why can't we go and eat the hallowed bread if we've been with women? Why? <coughs> Leviticus chapter 15. Leviticus chapter 15. Oh, Levitical law. Leviticus chapter 15. Leviticus chapter 15. Leviticus chapter 15. Read verse 16 to 18. And whatever I don't finish on the message tonight, I will finish it tomorrow for you, and I promise you that. Leviticus chapter 15, reading verse 16 to 18. And if any man's seed of copulation go out from him, then he shall wash all his flesh in water and be unclean until the wet church. The evening and every garment and every skin wherein is a seed of copulation shall be washed with water and be unclean until the even. The woman also with whom man shall lie with seed of copulation, they shall both bathe themselves in water and be unclean until the evening. So if you come together with your wife or your husband Friday night, you are unclean and when the Sabbath done. <coughs> So for the whole of the South, you're unclean. Everybody quiet. <laughs> oh, I'm a preacher! I see your whole text tonight! Oh, Alright, come with me. The book of 1 Corinthians chapter 7. The book of 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. <laughs> 1 Corinthians chapter 7, reading verse 25. You know, no one ever taught me this. You know, the Holy Ghost taught me this himself. And it took me about two years to understand this. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, reading verse 32. And 34 to 34. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, 32 to 34. And the Bible says, are you there? If you are there, let me hear you say amen. Alright, good. But I would have you without carefulness. He that is unmarried, care for the things that belong to the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But he that is married, care for the things that are of the world, how he may please his wife. Okay? There is a difference also between a wife and a virgin. The unmarried woman, care for the things of the Lord, that she may be holy in body and in spirit but she that is married caring for the things of the world how she may please her husband so when you're married you cannot be holy both in body and spirit when you come together as a husband you have not sinned no you haven't but there's a level of holiness with God when you keep the seventh day Sabbath that God says leave your wife to the middle of the week I'm giving you six days but when the Sabbath comes, you must be holy yes. on a level which you may not even understand now, but you soon will. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So then Isaiah finishes off. Isaiah 58 finishes off. Isaiah 58 finishes off. Reading verse. Oh. 
find it now. We could be over at one side if we read one eye. So I have chapter 58. And the Bible says, read in verse 13. We want to repair the breach. Do you want to repair the breach? Do you want God to use you to repair the breach? We don't want to have no new theology or no new doctrine. We want the old time religion, brothers and sisters. Because God is an old time religionist. He ain't going to change to make us feel comfortable. We have to come up to God's standard. Amen. Oh, you know what? We're going to be in problems. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable, and shall honor him on doing thine own ways. <laughs> Nor finding thine own pleasure. Oh, that word just comes striking me now in a different type of format. And let me tell you something. When you come together as husband and wife, it is work. Hard work. Hard work. <laughs> Hard work. God has given you six days to work and soon, soon God is going to reveal to some people what that holiness is and I don't know yet but one thing I do know there's a level of holiness we don't know as God's people but you know what when you, when you, if you want to get to heaven we're going to have to know it it's more than just keeping the commandments by the letter or by the spirit. It's more than just not looking at a woman and lusting after her in your heart. You've got to get to the point where it is it, it, so distasteful for you to lust after a woman or to lust after a man. We haven't got there yet. We're still struggling with sin. When you're in heaven, you're not going to be struggling with sin. Still love me? Yes, yes. Very much. Very much. Back to me. <laughs> oh, brother, get me up on the screen now, brother. Get me up on the screen. Let me preach the word what God has placed upon my heart. And then we're going to go home. And by grace, I'm going to take up my watch and make sure I don't see pastor's eyes looking at me. <laughs> yes, Lord. Back to Eden, part one. Till death do us part. Oh, dictionary definition of law. Law, a rule or set of rules instituted by act of parliament, custom, or practice in order to punish those who offend the conventions. Charter, code, constitution, command, covenant, decree, rule, statute, principle, regulation, standard. Two divine institutions. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the hosts of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God did what, church? He blessed. He blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because that in it he had. I spoke about that already. He had rested from all his work which God created and made. Oh, and God said, let us make man in our image after our lives and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over the whole earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created the him, but male and female created the him. And God did what, church? He blessed them. And God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and stop doing and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Yes, and, and the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. We're going to talk about the origins of marriage now. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, of every tree of the garden, thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat it. For the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. And some people may be asking the question, if God said that the day you eat, you're going to die. The reason why man didn't drop dead that day, because as soon as man became a sinner, Jesus became our Savior.
save God. Yes, sir. Yes. Yes. And the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. And it's still not good for the man to be alone. But sometimes it's better. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It might not be good, but it's better. Yes, sir. That the man shall be alone. I will make him and help me. For him. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. Whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And can you just imagine Adam just being born, just being made by God, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life? Adam came alive in the full vigor of youth and he was seeing the cow and he see a male and a female. He see a donkey, male and a female. And he see all these animals, male and female. And he see him one. <laughs> He felt lonely. In verse 20, it's up there on your screen. And Adam gave names to all cattle, to the fowl of the air, to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found and help meet for him. Mm. Someone to help him. Mm. Not to fight and argue with him. Mm. <laughs> but to help him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. That word, no local, that was general and steady. Yes, sir. Mm. Yes, sir. And he took just one of his ribs. He never took two. He never gave him two wives. He took one of his ribs. And never took it from his skull so she could rule him. She never took it from his foot so he could walk all over. He took it from the side right yes, next sir. to his heart. One rib. Yes, sir. Mm. And crows of the flesh instead thereof, and the rib which Lord God had taken from man made he a womb man. A man with a womb. Singing man twins. Yes. Adam started to sing. Yes. Yeah. Mm. Huh. Come on. Now there's the bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called a womb man. Because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother shall cling unto his wife and they shall be two. Wow. And let me tell you something. If you do not know it, when you get married, young men, you must have somewhere to put your wife. Yes. Yes. Amen. Yes. Come on. Amen. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. Let me move on from there before I get myself into it. But sin entered this world. You see, Satan hates these two institutions more than anything. You know why? Because it protects the moral fabric of society, both physically yes, and spiritually. Yes, so he loves when men and women without being blessed, without any commitment, and they just shack up, spoil up themselves, and move on, bruise, battered. Yes, sir. Uh-huh. And then all the young lady listens to the man, and the man tells the young lady, oh, you're going to be my, my everything. You're going to be my everything, and you're going to be my everything. She listens to him and says, oh, okay. And then she gives herself to him, and then she's pregnant, and then you know what he says, you know what? <laughs> Work is done, I'm moving on. Oh, and leaves her to look after the child, and let me tell you something, my sisters, in the name of Jesus, let no man touch her until he gets a blessing from the living God. Yeah. And if any man does, tell him to take your hands off you. Amen. Because your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Amen. And if he had any respect to the Holy Ghost, he wouldn't even touch you neither. He disrespect the Holy Ghost and you. Yes. And the angels who are watching. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Protect your environment. Yes. See, the Sabbath is between God and man. Come on. You see, the marriage is between a man and a woman. But so let me tell you something. In between the man and the woman, God is right there. Yes. Yes. 
And if your marriage is based on that, that you have Jesus in your marriage between you and your wife, there's no way the husband can go around Jesus and hit him or wife. There's no way this wife can look through Jesus and start with the husband unnecessarily. Because every time she argues, it's Jesus. Every time he goes to a hit him, it's Jesus. Have Jesus in your marriage. Oh yes, sin entered by Eve. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. It wasn't supposed to be in sorrow, won't bring forth children. A woman wasn't was supposed to go on the bed and scream daylight. Have mercy. Have mercy. She wasn't supposed to be screaming and making a whole heap of noise. It's supposed to be a beautiful occasion. Yes. Because we were the first. Um, creation of God which was able to reproduce ourselves. Yes. It's supposed to have been a beautiful experience a woman giving birth. Yes. But every time a woman has birth now, it must remind us that there is sin. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth Hold on, let me read and come again. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. What's conception? It's not when you're having a baby, it's making a baby! That's right. Your conception's gonna become sorrowful! The lot which has been fallen upon woman because of sin makes conception sometimes so sorrowful. Yes. Hmm. And that desire shall be to thy husband. And you know what, sisters, unfortunately, he shall rule over thee. Yes. What if Adam never sinned with Eve? Huh? What if Adam never sinned with Eve? What if Adam said, you know what, Eve, that's your problem. When God comes, you and him is going to have to deal with that situation. I mean, that to that apple. You work with God, and I'm touching that apple. But you see, he made up his mind that if Eve's going to perish, he's going to perish with her. That's not love. Because God is love. And you must put God first. That's not love. That's bordering on worship. He got to the point where Eve came before God. Hmm. And God said, Thou shalt have no other idol before me. Yes. So he made us worship Eve because she looked so beautiful. He said, How can I not have this woman with me for the rest of my life? He should have thought about how can he not have Jesus with him for the rest of his life? Yes. Mm. <laughs> Eve was deceived, but she was warned to stay by her husband's side. She made up her mind that she wanted to have some independence. Yes, sir. Watch it, sir. Watch it. <laughs> I was studying today, you know. I was studying about the contraceptive pill. Sister wife said in the name of Jesus, she hopes that it will never ever come to the light of day. 1960 it came to the light of day. You know why? Because women was, was allowed to have sexual freedom. Adam was not deceived. He ate the fruit because he did not want to be without his wife. And what do their names mean? Well, man means one who thinks. Woman means the soft one. I told you when Adam was made, God never made another Adam and make one big, tough man come run up to him. He made a soft one. No big man with big muscles. Both of them look at each other, where you go from? <laughs> From you. He made a soft one. Soft and delicate. One to help him to be a better man. Two men together can't make a better man. Too much testosterone. I can't Adam means red, one of the soil. Eve means the living one. And they are different. And there's ten things that makes a man and a woman different. Be with me. Yes, sir. Amen. The first thing between a man.
man and a woman they have different brain sizes. Yes. A man's brain is bigger than a woman's, yes. but a woman's wiring is different for every one neuron. What a man is connected, a woman has about five. Yes. Hmm. Hmm. But the problem is a woman is two dimensional. Yes, two dimensional, that's why they have problems parking. <laughs> and say yes, this will be the right way to do it. And it's three dimensions. But a woman is two dimensions before she knows it's another car. No one does need it. You know why? Because you're two dimensional. A woman can speak and listen at the same time. So while she's speaking to her friend, her friend's speaking back to her. And while she's listening, her friend's listening to her. And they can speak at the same time. We men, we can't do it. Hmm. 
Women have better hearing, better hearing than men. Oh, yes. Your actual, the, you could you could listen to more octaves, more higher pitches than men. That's why they can speak and listen at the same time. Men are more aggressive because they have ten times more testosterone than a woman. But what you see is what you get with a man. <laughs> but you see the woman's hormones. Her brain is wired that she can be more manipulative and deceptive and cunning as she puts her mind to it. Don't try and figure out a woman, man. Men, don't try and figure them out. Because if they make up their mind to deceive you, you wouldn't even know what to think of. Now, Men communicate an average of 7,000 words a day. But a woman communicates an average of 21,000 words a day. That's words, that's vocal sounds and body language. That's why a woman, when she talks, she can bend her head like that. I know that we men can't do that. We don't talk straight. A woman says, you You know how women usually go on? Their bodily expressions. 21,000, but it was the next thing what really troubled me. If a man does not use up his quota of words, he's okay. He will think them through at the end of the day, follow them away in his brain, and the next day he will go to task with it and he'll go to sleep and he's like, all right, but a woman needs to use up her quota or it will drive her crazy. Because a woman talks her problems, it's going around her head like a CD. Boom, 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 and she can't sleep for love or money. And she needs to talk at night to her husband. The husband wants to sleep, she wants to talk. And she can't go to bed unless she talks her problems out. And if she's only done 10,000 words, men, we've got another 11,000 left. Good research. You want to go home early and we finish the rest tomorrow? Yes. <laughs> and then we finish up the rest of the world. Let's look at the Bible. Oh, four things we need to look at. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walk in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto who? Adam. Adam and he said unto him, Where art thou? And the Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us, to know good and evil. And now least he put forth his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man. Yes, sir. Mm. And he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword, which turned him away to keep the way of the tree of life. Now this is the book of the generation of Adam in the day that God created man the likeness of God made he him. Male and female created he them and he blessed them and God called their name Adam. In the day when they were created. First thing you must realize that God called unto the man. We are up now. Yes. Second thing, God said the man has been exposed to sin. He has become like one of us. He's not come like God, but he knows the difference between good and evil. Third thing, God drove the man out of the garden so as not to sit still, eat from the tree of life. He never drove out the woman. The woman had to follow the man. Yes, sir. Yes. And God called their name Adam. Yes. She never had a double barrel surname. Mm. Mm. <laughs> Come on. The rules of commitment, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands, not to a next man's husband, next woman's husband. Amen. 
Amen. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wife be to their own husbands in a few things. In everything. That don't mean if your husband is abusing you, you must allow yourself to be abused. No. But when a decision is being made, the husband and wife must talk things over and the husband is the head of the whole. And as long as he fears God, sisters, agree with him and work with him. Come on, sisters, say amen, don't give me no cut eye. <laughs> that's the Bible I'm preaching. Yes, sir, yes. Husband, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Yes. So, in other words, the same way Jesus loved his church, men, we must love our wives. Amen. And we must love them to make them feel that no one in the whole world can love them sweeter than you. Right. Don't make them think the grass can be sweeter and greener and taller on the other side. That's right. Right. Verse 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself, glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle. The way you're supposed to look after your wife, she's supposed to look, supposed to look just glorious. Amen. The way you're supposed to make your wife feel, she must have no spots. That's right. Stressing her out. Amen. And she must have no wrinkles neither. Amen. A woman's job is not just to cook and clean. No, come on. Don't make her no wrinkles. Sometimes you must make her put her feet up and look after her. Yes, sir. So she can stay beautiful for a lot longer. Yes, sir. Yes. Amen. Yes. Yes, sir. Some of us use and abuse our wives until our wives wrinkle up and then we say we're going to look for another new thing. Yes. We put our soul salvation and jeopardy. Yes. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but doth nourish it and cherish it, even as the law of the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is the great mystery about speak concerning Christ and the church. This is talking about Jesus and his church becoming one flesh. Yes. The saints are going to be flesh. When they get to heaven, Jesus is going to be flesh. And the Apostle Paul is saying, This is a great mystery. We're not talking about husband and wife. I'm talking about Jesus becoming flesh and becoming flesh for eternity. Amen. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence. Amen. Amen. What's reverence? Amen. Respect and look up to him. A man needs to be respected. Yes. And he'd be more a man for you, my sister. Amen. You start disrespecting your man mm. or your husband, you cut him in half. Yes, sir. You make him feel four foot tall when he's supposed to be like yes. ten foot tall. Yes. Mm. Yes. The way many wives treat their husbands, you make them feel four foot tall. They don't want to leave the family in worship. They don't want to go for things in life. You make them feel four foot tall. Reverence them. Amen. Amen. Make them feel ten foot tall. Amen. Amen. That's the word. Amen. Okay. <laughs> now, concerning the things worth you wrong to me, it's good for a man not to touch a woman. Mm. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. Let the husband bring unto the wife due benevolence as kindness. And likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife has not power of her own body, but the husband. And likewise also the husband not have power of his own body, but the wife. Defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time, that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer. Because when you're fasting and praying, your body is not really in the mood to do anything more than holiness. That's right. Amen. Hmm. Amen. Hmm. And come 
come together again that this Satan tempts you not for your incontinency. But I speak this by permission, not a command, for I would that all men were even as I myself. But every man have his proper gift of God. One after this man, and not after that. I say therefore to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them to abide even as I. But if they cannot contain, let them marry. For it's better to marry than to burn. That's not burning in hellfire. That's burning with uncontrollable passion. That's right. That's you like. Oh, forgive me. I'm not against any religion and I'm not against any leaders of any religion. But the priests of the Catholic Church are not allowed to marry. And let me tell you something, it doesn't make a difference what we say or do. A man will always be a man unless he's controlled by the Holy Ghost. And if he has some passions which technically his body naturally makes, he's going to want to express himself. And if he wants to express himself in the church, if he can't, he ain't gonna trouble a woman because his expression may be found to be a woman being pregnant. Mm. So therefore he would express himself with a little boy. Oh, so all day just walking up and down hot like fire, waiting for someone to express himself. Mm. And I do a lot of men's talks. And I see a lot of men in their 19s, 20, 21, 22, up to 25, 30, and they're not married, and the Holy Ghost is not controlling them, and their diet is out of harmony, and the food, what they eat, inflames them to the point where their passion is so uncontrolled, they could not do anything for the cause of heaven, because if anyhow they came up here, Satan would use them, mash them up, spoil them up, and make God's truth come to, come into disrepute. Yes. They're inflamed with passion. So the Apostle Paul is telling God's people, listen, if you're not married and you're burning with passion, get married. That's right. Amen. And unto the marriage I command you in the life by the Lord, let not the wife depart from her husband, but if she depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband, and let not the husband put away his wife. Just as there are eight laws of health, there are also eight laws of marriage. Amen. Is it? Yes. Well, you must have God in your marriage. Yes. You must learn to cleave to one another. Amen. You must learn to talk to one another. Amen. You must learn to trust one another. Amen. You must learn to have respect for one another. You must learn to be romantic with one another. You must learn to have intimacy with one another. Amen. I don't believe a man's supposed to be in one bedroom and his wife is another one. Have mercy. No, sir. <laughs> Come on, sir. <laughs> when you're married, in the same bedroom. That's right. And if you don't want to be in there, you must pray about it. Yes, sir. You're married, but you're in two separate bedrooms. <laughs> and you must love one another. And divorce is the opposite of these eight laws of marriage. You must have God. You must cleave with one another. You must cleave to one another. You must encourage one another. Yes. You must bless one another with love. Amen. You must communicate with one another. You mustn't hold no secrets. Now I'm not saying you must tell your wife everything and the wife tell the mouth about everything. But you must learn to communicate with one another. That's why I told you to take off the television because sometimes the television becomes a communicator. Yes. Yes. You must learn to trust. You must have a sacred circle. Don't bring a third person into your marriage. Amen. To start telling this and telling that and he's no good or she's no good. Let me tell you something. Let Jesus tell you who's good and who's not good. Amen. Too much people are jealous because of your marriage too. Since they're married mashup, they want your marriage mashup. Just keep your marriage between you and your husband. Amen. Yes, sir. Amen. You must learn to have respect for one another because let me tell you something, I am a child of God. Yes. My wife is a child of God. I've got to treat her as she is a temple of the Holy Ghost. Amen. So I give my wife the fullest respect that she deserves. Amen. And husbands, you must do the same thing. Amen. And let me tell you something, if you do not know him, even in the bedroom, you must respect your wife and the wife must respect the husband. Amen. Amen. Hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. 
Romance, we must be nice with one another. Yes. Men, you must buy your wife some gifts sometimes. Yes, sometimes when you're going home, when you're going into the car, husband, even though you've been married to your wife for 40, 50 years, open the door for her. Amen. Make her feel special. You know the way it used to be when you was caught in up? Be just like that again. Amen. Just because you're married, courtship mustn't finish. That's right. You must continue your courtship. Amen. That keeps your marriage alive. Amen. You must be intimate. You to somebody the other day, he said he's never seen his wife in her birthday. I said, something wrong, brother. She said, brother, get the light on. I don't see nothing. I said, I said so, so what happened there? Nothing happens. He told me one time he went to turn off the light ship. Adam and Eve was not ashamed. Amen. Husband and wife, you should not be ashamed. Right. And if you have any defects, you should feel comfortable to tell your husband or your wife. Right. Listen, listen, we're just born with what we're born with. I can't, I, 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 I can't help you, I'm born with a big mount. It's just the way it is. Right. If my wife's in my mouth too big, too bad. You have to argue with your knees, ass is him, make me. Right. And if your foot were too good, or your back were too good, <laughs> you just have to learn to live with it. Yes. And you know what? If you learn to live with it and you pray about it, you learn to love it. Yes, sir. Yes. And trust me, trust me, trust me, trust me, trust me, brothers and sisters. True beauty is not on the outside. That's right. True beauty is not on the outside because one day, even though someone wrote me a letter and told me I should stop talking about it, one day we're all going to bed up. One day her hair will be lovely and her skin soft. One day his muscles won't be big. He'll have a belly. He won't be strong. He won't be able to perform the way he used to perform when he was younger, ladies. But he will still give you the best love he can give you. by talking wonderful things from the word of the living God. And let me tell you something, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Love is a principle of the mind. Of the mind. It's not a feeling. Whether you wake up feeling good or you wake up, wake up feeling bad, your wife will always be your wife. Your husband will always be your husband. And you know what you gotta do? You gotta just say, listen, I've gotta love my husband because God wants me to love my husband. Amen. And I gotta treat him better than how he treats me. Yes. So what you do in your marriage, you try and out bless one another by the way you treat one another. Marriage is not about what I can get, it's about what I can give. So when you continue to give and give and give, you don't want nothing because you give so much, Jesus gives you back. Amen. Many of us want marriages and we say, you are not treated me good and I want this and I want that. You know what you gotta do? You gotta give so much that they're full up and drunk That's with your life. Right. That's right. That's right. Amen. 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 When last have we been drunk in love? Mm -hmm. Tina's can't wait to see your husband That's or your right. wife. That's right. You're drunk. Yes. You just can't wait to hold her hand. And tell her how much you love her. Men, when the last have you told your wife you love her? That's right. Wives, how, when the last have you told your husband that you love him? Right. And we thank God for him every yes. sin. Yes. When the last have you told one another that? Yes, sir. Love it, Lord. Your people have come tonight in life.
spoken to them words that you placed in my heart to bless them. Tomorrow night we will finish off the rest of this message and I pray in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. You will make husbands and wives take an introspective look at how they are with each other. And let's climb up the ladder and let's start blessing one another a lot more. Amen. We don't love each other enough, Lord. Mm. The way we treat one another, many people who are married are going to go hell because they married the wrong person. So please, Lord, cover us up with your holy wings. Yes, Lord. Bring us home safely with your holy angels. Lord, we ask for a royal escort every single night. And I pray, loving Lord, you give us a royal escort tonight. Amen. And bring us back tomorrow where we can tabernacle in thy word just a little longer. It's our prayer and our praise. We divide thanks in Jesus' name that everybody say. Amen. Amen. Amen.